face See you smiling over us Unseen angels celebrate Fall the joys in the church we good man it's good to see everybody this morning it's a good day to be in God's house this morning it's a good day to worship together man we bring joy into this place because he brought joy to us amen and he's good that way and his joy comes from salvation his joy comes from the gift that he defeated and conquered death on the cross and rose from the grave so that we, we could be set free. We could be given hope. We could be given life. We could be given freedom in his love and in his glory this morning. And that's what we're going to sing about. So here's the deal. At West Metro, if this is your first time here, we're super glad to have you here. My name is Jeremy, by the way. I'm the worship pastor here and the vision pastor. Um, listen, no judgment. You worship how you feel free this morning. So if you want to put your hands up, get your hands up. You want to move, shake, whatever, make it happen. We're good here in this place, okay? But we're just going to worship together. It's going to be good this morning, so. Let's sing this together. I was buried beneath my shame. And two could carry that kind of weight. It was my tomb till I met you. Come on, church. Well, I was breathing, but not alive. And all my failures, I tried.
morning. We're going to talk about who we were and who he is this morning. That promise. Let's sing that. I needed rescue. My sin was heavy. But chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter. I was an orphan. And you called me a citizen of heaven. sing this bridge pretty good this morning. You did a good job. We can do better. You know what I mean, church? Let's sing it like we mean it this morning. You know what I'm saying? I want to hear it with our whole heart and our whole voice this morning. Who we are, who God is, the promise that we walk in, and that he called our name and we went running out of the grave because of who he is. Conquering death, conquering shame. Let's sing that again, come on. I needed rescue, my sin was heavy. A chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan. Now you call me a sin. Come on, church.
notice this morning, but we are just, um, we are taking time this morning to tell God who he is. And not that he needs to hear it. He knows he's God. But there is something powerful about speaking that. About singing that together in corporate prayer. goodness of God, the power of God. Who he is and what he means to us in this church, in our community, in our culture, in our our world today. In a world full of doubts and questions, he is the answer. full of darkness. He is the light. He's the way. He's the truth. He's our salvation. He's our hope. And with all the things in the world that we bring into this place, it's so good to remember that God is still exactly who he's always been and who he will always be. And that is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the God of our salvation, the God of Isaac, Abraham, and Jacob. He is the God of hope. He is the God of healing. He is our provider. He is our standard. He is everything this morning, church. There is absolutely nothing that is greater than him. And no matter what the enemy throws at us, no matter what the world throws at us, church, this morning, guess what? We are not fighting for the victory. We walk in the victory this morning. We have already won.
majesty There is no power in hell Or any who can stand I live 
So this morning, as we hear your word, let us be challenged in our hearts by it. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You guys can be seated. seems like so much of our life has been trying to overcome obstacles to get where it is that we're supposed to be. Think about it in your relationships, in your job, in your finances or health, even in your relationship with God. How much of your energy, how much of your time and focus is spent trying to do what is necessary in order to get what you need from your circumstances or from God and get where you need to be in each of those areas. But I think maybe the question is, if we're supposed to be working to accomplish the Christian life, how much work do you have to do before you experience the rest of the Christian life that's promised in Scripture? Paul actually says in almost every letter that he wrote that we've been crucified already with Christ, that we're already resurrected with Christ, that we ascended and sat down with Christ, 
And so the Christian life is not what we do for God, but how we live from what God has already done by grace for us in Jesus. And then he writes this incredible thing to the Colossians. To that church, he specifically said, since then you've already been raised with Christ, since that's already been done for you. Since that's true, set your heart and your mind on where you are in Christ with God. And he even tells us why. He says, for you died already, and your life now, today, here, is hidden in Christ with God. So just imagine it. Right now, Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. He's finished his work to redeem us and make us one in spirit with God so that we could actually set our minds on where we are with him and the Father. In John 17, Jesus actually prayed to the Father right in front of his disciples that you and I would be where he is, that we would enjoy his union with God, that we would experience all that he's given us freely and witness and share in his glory. So imagine God the Father seated on his throne and at his right hand is Jesus Christ and you are seated in Christ with the Father. So the love that Jesus has, you have. And the security that he has, you have. The confidence in God's work that he has, you have. What's his by merit, what he has earned by his work and righteousness and authority is yours by grace. My prayer for you is not that you would come to some understanding of what you have to do in order to get what you need from the Father or get him to put you in the place that he wants you to be, but rather that you would know the value and the hope and the power at work in your life because of what Christ has already accomplished on your behalf. That instead of you trying to meet what God requires and step up to some standard that he has for you, that you would enjoy the finished work of Jesus having met every requirement and having already surpassed every standard and given his life freely to you as a new creation, as a saint and a son, that you can live from where you are and who you are by grace in Christ with God. Let's pray and go home. No. <laughs> the gospel is not that you are forgiven. Your forgiveness is necessary for the gospel. Just let that sit for a minute. You got to figure out if it's true. I know. You, some of y'all have never heard me before. Do I believe that? Is that true? The gospel is not that you are forgiven. Your forgiveness is necessary for the gospel. See, you had to be made compatible with the life of God so that you could be put in union with Christ, so that his crucifixion could be your crucifixion and his resurrection could be your resurrection and his ascension could actually be your ascension with Christ, that him being seated, having finished his work to redeem us into relationship with the Father, that that seatedness, that rest could be your rest. You see, forgiveness was necessary for union and union with Christ is the gospel. You really have spiritually been crucified with Christ and you really have spiritually been resurrected as a new creation because you have a new spirit and that's who you are. You are not this body that is falling apart and fading away, praise God. I'm ready for my upgrade. <laughs> and when this body is in the ground, falling apart, well, it's already doing that, but when it's in the ground doing that, 
I will still be alive because I have a new me in the old body, increasingly old body. And that me will one day get a new body in heaven. But that proves that what I see and what I feel and sometimes what I experience is not the core of who I am. So there really is a new reality to who you are. And forgiveness was necessary for newness. And forgiveness was necessary for compatibility because forgiveness was necessary for union so that you can truly believe that in Christ you also are crucified and resurrected and ascended and seated with the Father, already compatible by grace. You didn't earn that. And if you've been made compatible by grace, then you can also receive by grace everything that is true of him who is in union with you. We look at our life and say, I don't look and feel and act righteous, but Christ is in me and I'm a new creation and he defines my reality. So my righteousness, my holiness, my blamelessness, my redemption, my fellowship with the father, my sonship with him, that is all by grace, but it's no less true. What is true of Jesus Christ by merit, what he has earned with the father is true of you by grace. We need to stop acting like what is true of us is not true or we're never going to know who we really are in our daily experience (coughs) there's some problems does that make sense a little bit means that you're righteous you just didn't cause it means that you're holy you just didn't cause it you don't always act like it i didn't always act like a sinner when i was a sinner now i'm a saint and i don't always act that way either Your behavior doesn't determine who you are. You are who you were born as. That's why the old us is crucified and there's a new creation reborn in (laughs) Jesus Christ. We've got to stop taking these verses in scripture and assuming there's some ethereal, figurative language that really don't have anything to do with everyday life. Either Christ is in you and this is real or he's not really in you and you're not really born again and you're not really a spiritual being and all of this is pretty worthless. Just go home now. Either it's true or it's not true. And if it's true, it changes everything. And we've got to stop acting like nothing has changed. So my name, hi, my name is Mike Daniel. I lead a ministry from San Antonio, Texas. I must apologize that on the screen there for just a moment, it said, go Spurs, go. (laughs) I'm sorry. Don't kick me out for that. I'll say much more heretical sounding things, you know, like you're forgiven and holy and righteous and God loves you and likes you just as you are. That's probably harder for some people to believe. But um, so I came up here because I was invited to do a women's conference and to speak to the staff and to do a a bit of a men's conference and spoke at a luncheon. And we did a couple we did a couples night. How many of y'all were at the couples night last night? That was so fun. Thank you guys for coming. That was a blessing. I just love that. And so today I'm preaching. I'm going to meet with the youth later. So I had one uh, girl that grew up as my child and one adolescent was enough. So uh, pray for me this afternoon with all of the, uh, uh, the youth here. And, um, and I'm working with another church uh, tomorrow in Oklahoma City. Uh, if, I don't know if you all know Grace Church with, I think, Steve Eden is the lead pastor is his title there. And I worked with the ministry, some folks here from that ministry called Scope Ministries. Wonderful counseling and discipleship ministry from, from a grace perspective in Oklahoma City. If, if you need discipleship or if you need counseling and need a venue for that, I highly recommend Scope Ministries International in town. So that's what I was doing. I spent a week, it'll be a week um, tomorrow, I think, uh, up here, and I'm tired. (laughs) And loving it, but tired. Anybody else tired? So we have some conflicts with scripture, and that feeds right into it. See, I have rest in Christ, but I feel tired a lot. I have comfort in the Holy Spirit, but I deal with chronic pain from a car accident every day for 32 years. Well, 32 years, two months, and about 12 days. But who's counting? (laughs) Every day. But Christ, the Spirit is my comforter, but I deal with pain. Jesus Christ gives us peace. He said, my peace I give to you, and I don't give as the world gives. In fact, he himself is my peace, and I've got him fully, completely. And yet I experience chaos and anxiety and worry and sometimes just outright fear. 
Hello, pandemic. Rest, tired, <laughs> abundant life, don't know how I'm gonna pay my bills. I have all of these things in Christ and I experience a whole lot of scarcity and lack in my circumstances. Is the truth how I feel or is the truth what God says? Is the truth what's happening in my circumstances or is the truth who he is in and through me? What's the eclipsing reality of your life today, folks? Because if Christ is in you, we can either live from him or we can live from the world, but we can't live from both. And that's the rub. That's the rub. Because I'm tired, but I'm loving life. Because I get to be with you guys today. That, so where's the life? Is the life in fixing the tired and fixing the scarcity and fixing the finances and fixing the pain and fixing those things? Is it making the most of a difficult situation or is it living out of the overflow and abundance and truth of what Jesus says is true of me? And most Christians are living just like the world, putting Jesus' name on worldly hopes. And they're not having any different experience than the person in the cubicle next to them or the whatever, the yard mowing next to them or whatever else they're doing. It's the exact same experience and they're putting Jesus' Jesus' name on worldly hopes, and they never get any more rest in their circumstances, and they never get any more peace in the middle of traffic jams, <laughs> me either, and they never get any more of any of the stuff that Christ promised when they're hoping that Jesus will fulfill all of those promises from their circumstances, and Jesus never intended to be the path to a more worldly, successful kind of life. He said, I am the life. I am not the means to any other life but me. And we either have to figure it out or we miss out on it completely. It either has to make sense or we're just like everybody else, doesn't know him. Jesus gets to make a difference in your life, but we have to start living in the truth that he's told us and, and, and stop thinking that we're just pretending that our life is better than everybody else's because that's just more exhausting. And I've lived that life. I was a young pastor uh, when I was a young pastor, um, pastoring churches and pretending to be better off in my life with Christ than everybody else that didn't know him. And the reality is my experience was just like theirs and I didn't know who I was in Christ. So it's even worse because I have to pretend that I know better and I got more and things are going okay. And they're going the same as everybody else's. The traffic jam is no easier for the guy in Christ than it is for the guy that isn't. Just listen to their language. It's exactly the same. <laughs> but one feels really bad about it. <laughs> the point is not to feel guiltier about going through the exact same stuff as the rest of the world. That's not the point. There's abundance to be had despite the circumstances, in spite of what we have to walk through with everybody else. The grace of God makes itself known in contrast to the struggles of the world. Not because it's the path to more comfort and ease in every circumstance we walk through. Sometimes it is because God's just sweet. My daughter growing up when she was a kid, sometimes we would have cake for breakfast. It was just fun. We could do that. God's just like that. Sometimes we get to have fun. Sometimes he's just sweet to you and he meets your needs in some worldly, obvious, fun ways because he wants to give you that little touch, that little peck on the cheek that says, I love you, I got you, we're not going to do this all the time, but today it's okay. But my life for you is not the external touches. My life for you is the indwelling, overflowing reality of Christ in you, the one and only hope of glory. Now, either that verse in Colossians 1.27 is true, that the one and only hope of the world and of God and of glory forever and ever is the indwelling life of Christ in you in the chair that you're sitting in right now. Either Christ is in you and he's the only hope for living out who God is in us and for us and through us and for us, right? For us. Who he is for us is the life within us. Not the freedom from traffic jams and bills we have to pay and everything else, but the enoughness of his grace to deal with the things that are death to the world. What if your supply for life was divinely empowered instead of your life just being easier so you didn't have to have divinity within you? 
So I want to look at a passage today that is one of the greatest and yet most often missed miracles in Scripture. <laughs> and uh, we're going to kind of run through the verse, and then I want to talk about it a little bit. But it's right in John uh, uh, chapter 13, the night before, well, it's the night of Jesus' arrest, the night before his crucifixion. And I call this radical availability. So we're looking at John 13. We're going to begin in about verse 3. I think that's what's on your screen let's just walk through it. I'm going to highlight some verses both on the screen and as I'm reading. But if you have your Bible, read along with us. It says this. It says, Jesus, knowing, he knows three things. I don't want you to miss it. And I'll explain why this is the greatest miracle to me in the gospel because, well, it's just incredibly powerful and most people miss it. But he knows three things that the Bible says then empowers him to do something that no one else in all of history could ever do. You might not have known that it was here, hidden in this passage. But it literally says because he knows three things, he did something that no one else can do, which means that no one else knows what he knows in this passage. But you could. So here are the three things. Number one, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands. That's number one. And number two, knowing that he had come from God And number three, knowing that he was going back to God, he did this miraculous thing that no one else could do. He stood up. (laughs) He rose from supper. He stripped in front of his closest friends. He was about to be crucified, keep in mind. This is the dress rehearsal of his lowliness and humility right here. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and then to wipe them with the towel, which was the only thing he was wearing. It was wrapped around him. Why is that a great miracle? The disciples were arguing on the way to Jerusalem about who the greatest was. The mama's boys, John and James, boys of thunder, whatever. (laughs) Their mom came to Jesus and said, let one of my boys sit on your right and one of them sit on your left when you enter into your kingdom. And so they're vying for position and they're riding on Jesus' coattails and they think he's about to overthrow Rome. And so what ends up happening is they get into the upper room of a fairly wealthy family in Jerusalem for the Passover feast. And it's been being prepared all day long, but the servants of this wealthy household are all downstairs in the main house taking care of the family for the Passover. Passover. So they're washing the feet and preparing the dishes and bringing them to the master of the house who's conducting the feast to the family. But this is a loner room. It's kind of like a little rental. It's a and b in the first century. And Jesus and the disciples are taking, it's probably Mark's, uh, you, the, the writer of the gospel, it's probably, he was very young, it's like a teenage boy, but it's probably his parents their family home. And they're in the upstairs of that. There's a reason why we think that. I won't get into it now. That is speculation. It's not in scripture, but it's a really good guess. So they're in the upper room kind of taking care of themselves. And when they came in from having walked across the Mount of Olives, across the Kidron Valley, from the Garden of Gethsemane into the Eastern Gate, and then they hung a left and they went up into this wealthy family's upper room, probably an exterior entrance, right? So they walked up the stairs outside of the building and turned into the, to, into the little room that they were in. And having just done that in their sandaled, dirty feet, they're about to sit down. I don't have a good way to do this, so I'm just gonna do this if my back lets me. They sat down at a table that was about as high as this step is from this step. That's about how high the table is. So they're sitting there at this little low table, and when they start to eat, which is often with their hands, they're going to lean over and eat with their hands. So they're leaning over, using their right hand, leaning on their left a lot of times, and they're eating like that. I know you can't see me very well, sorry. So they're leaning on one side, and the person to their right has their stinky feet around them. (laughs) 
So when we talk about people washing their feet, it's a really good idea. You're coming into dinner and either their feet, we know who was to his right because John, remember the disciple whom Jesus loved, had his head on Jesus' breast. What does that mean? It means it was a small table. Doesn't mean anything else. It just means it was a small table because John's head's right here as they're eating. Makes perfect sense. But John is smelling Jesus' stinky feet. <laughs> I love that Jesus had stinky feet. All right, I can't sit like that very long. All right, so do you see the picture? The washing of the feet is the lowliest of duties, but it's an important part, especially at the Passover. They're gonna be here for hours smelling each other's stinky feet. And the problem is they're all trying to ride Jesus' coattails into glory who's about to overcome Rome and they all want to be as close to po as possible. They don't mind serving Jesus, but they don't want to be the one to do it if someone else could be lower on the totem pole. They're all vying for position. And the only reason that Jesus could actually stand up, step out of the circle of fellowship around the Passover feast, think about who steps out of that communion to serve them instead of to be part of them. He's the only one who could do it. And the reason that he could do it and serve everybody else is because he knew something that nobody else knew. We just saw it. He knew that God had already put everything into his hands, put everything under his feet, right? He had everything from God. I don't know what the next slide is, but why don't you show me? There we go. What do you do with the everythingness of God? What do you do when, when you, in Christ, have what he had? If it's true of him by merit, then it's true of you by grace. And he knew that he had everything, lacked for nothing in that circumstance. Well, it means that he's not losing anything from what anyone else, you know, that circumstance costs him nothing. He already had everything from God. He can afford to do this. That's number one. Number two, he knew that he had come from God. Jesus did not have an identity crisis. Go ahead and pull up that next slide. What do you do when you actually know who you are in Christ? You don't define yourself by anybody else's opinion. You don't strive to be something relative to anyone else in the room. So here's Jesus, number one, who knew that he already had everything from his father. He wasn't looking to gain anything. He wasn't afraid of losing anything. Nothing to gain, nothing to lose. And now we see he had nothing to prove. I don't have to act better than you. I don't have to gain anything from you. I don't have to get you to think anything about me. I can afford anything that you do think about me because you don't define my reality. I already know that I came from God. I'm not coming from whatever you're imagining. You're going to get me wrong a whole lot over the next three days, but I'm still perfectly fine knowing the truth of who I am. They're all about to abandon him anyway. I don't know that he's vying for anyone's opinion. He actually walked around and washed the disciples. He washed Judas's feet. Talk about having nothing to lose. Talk about humility. But that's not all. He also knew that he was about to return to the Father. Look at that next slide. What do you do when you know who's in? Well, I put it here. You have nothing to lose because you know who's in control. You know the end from the beginning. You know where you're going to end up? Do you know who's sovereign in the circumstances you're walking into this afternoon, tomorrow, next week, next month? You are not that person. You're not in control of what's coming next. You didn't even know what's coming next, but you know the one who is. Jesus knew who he was. Let me do it in order. Jesus knew what he had with his father. He knew who he was with his father, and he knew who was in control with his father. So he was empowered to do something that no one else could do, and that is serve everyone else without anything to lose. They didn't think more of him because he washed their feet. It messed them up. <laughs> And we don't fully get it because it's so out of context to our culture. You know, we're not thinking of stinky feet and who's serving whom. We're just thinking, oh, it's not very pleasant to wash somebody else's feet. That's not the deal. The deal is you are dirty so you can do the dirty job. 
what's our next slide? I, I thought I, I was going to have two of them, and I didn't pull it up here. So here's what happened. If you are like Christ, if you know that you have what is true of him by merit is true of you by grace, his life, his sufficiency, identity from his work, not your work, right? His activity, not your activity, his supply, not your activity efficacy for life, right? Not your effectiveness, but how effective he was on the cross. Your day is not going to be defined by how well you do, but how well he's already done. If you have by, by grace what only Christ could deserve and merit and cause and earn on the cross for you, then the best thing, the only thing, the wise thing is for you to receive it and walk in it. It'd be like if I pulled out whatever money I've got, and handed it to you, and well, you know, I can't spend that. Well, at some point, you might. You might actually want to spend what you've got. And when I realize that I'm completely bankrupt apart from Christ, but I'm not apart from Christ, then why, why wouldn't I walk in what I've received by grace? Because I didn't deserve it? Well, there's nothing that I have that I've deserved. It's all by grace. So if I'm going to enjoy the air I'm breathing and the car I drive, then I might as well enjoy the righteousness and redemption that he also could only provide, right? If he's giving me family and giving me love and giving me opportunity and I'm okay with those things because I need them, then I better stop striving for righteousness that only he could give me anyway. I better just start walking in what I've received. Does that make sense? I'm okay with him giving me a beautiful child and I'll receive that graciously, though I never deserve that. If I'll receive that, then I should probably receive holiness because I can't cause that either. You following me? You can never be the cause of what only Jesus Christ could do in and through you. If he's the life, let him live. If he's in you, let him live through you. Galatians 2.20 says that I, apart from Christ, have already been crucified with him. And I am no longer the one doing the living. But Jesus Christ is the one doing the living through me. Is Jesus Christ the one doing the living for you today? Because you don't get tired with what he does. I get tired because of what I'm doing. That's why we're entering into rest. He says, I'm going to give you rest. And all the Christians are going, I'm working for rest. I thought he was giving you rest. We either have it and we're walking in it. Now, I might be exhausted after this, but he is just faithful to get us through what he calls us to. And most Christians, I think most of us aren't experiencing that as a practical reality. We're living in the circumstances. Is, I don't, which side was the circumstances? That, he, over here. <laughs> We're living in the, oh no, it was over here, in the anxiety <laughs> and the struggle and the discomfort and the neediness. I call this the lie of lack, the things that I wish I could get by the flesh from the world for myself. And because I can't cause them, I live in exhausted, pain-riddled, struggling, needy, rejected, unproductive or barely productive life. That doesn't sound like abundance. It sounds like the world. But if I can trust that he is my enoughness, that I have what Christ had, that I am who Christ has made me, right? What I have and who I am, and that God is in control. He knows what I need, Matthew 6 says, so I don't have to live for my needs. I can be available to him. I can live with this radical availability to God, not because I always know how all my needs are going to get met, but because I'm not the one living to get them met. I'm trusting him to meet them, and so I'm available to him. That's worship in Romans 12, right? Because I see his mercies, because I'm empowered by his grace, I can live available to him because he's got to take care of my needs one way or another. It's not up to me how everything goes, so I might as well live a life of worship on me. We're living as if we're in the old covenant in the flesh, not yet indwelt, not yet reborn, not yet crucified and resurrected and ascended and seated in Christ. We don't really believe what we believe. Because you believe everything that I've said, if you're a believer, you know that all of that is true in scripture, but you're trying to live the Christian life in a way that will cause him to do what you're somehow meriting from him. I know that you are because that's what I have often done. That's why we're so underwhelmed at times by the Christian life. 
It just doesn't seem any different. If the guy up front can be that honest about it, you know, I'm just challenging you to be that honest about it. It just doesn't always seem that different. God is not trying to empower you to be a better overcomer of all of your circumstances. That's not the economy of the Christian life. He has already overcome sin and death and wants you to live from him as you let him live through you. He leaves the choice up to you and the work up to him. He leaves the choice up to you, but the work is up to him. The problem is, what if he doesn't do what I want? What if he doesn't lead me where I want? What if he doesn't accomplish what I want? Well, do you think you're going to do better without him? But God, I've got to make this happen with my kids. How's that working out for you? Betray him. We're about to deny him. We're not going to be around while he was being beaten and abused. By the way, the one man who didn't deserve to be, so that the rest of us who do would never have to be. He who knew no sin stood up and got dirty for all of those who should have been getting dirty for him. When he got done washing the disciples' feet, he, it says he sat back down and said these incredible words. He said, do you understand what I've done for you today? And the reality is they couldn't understand it, but I want us to understand it. 2 Corinthians 5 says, he who knew no sin became sin for us that we could be made the righteousness of God. It is not something you do for him. It is something he's done to you. He has made you righteous, and sometimes you'll even act like it. But your behavior doesn't determine your identity. Your birth determines your identity. You've been reborn in Christ, living as the person he's made you. It's an entirely different thing because Jesus knew who he was, so he lived like it, like he had nothing to gain, nothing to lose, and nothing to prove in the circumstance. It's a different kind of life because he was possessing a different kind of life. But there's nothing that was true of him in that moment that isn't true of you in your chair this morning. What he had, you have. Fullness from the Father in Christ Jesus. In fact, Colossians 2, 9 says all the fullness of God resided bodily in the person of Jesus Christ. And we love that verse. All of God in Jesus Christ. Man, Jesus was the man. But there's not so much as a period before the next verse. Verse 10, uh, it's Colossians 2, 10 says, and you have that fullness in him. All the fullness of God was in Jesus, and all of his fullness is in you. And we love the first verse and hate the second verse because if this is it, it's a little underwhelming. It's because I'm living over here in the flesh trying to make the Christian life happen, and God never intended for you to accomplish, to cause, to produce the life that only Jesus Christ has and can freely give you and live through you as you're available to him. Do you want to know how you experience divine fruit, the fruit of the Spirit of uh, um Galatians 5, I was going to say Ephesians 5, but Galatians 5 lists the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace, divine peace. That means peace that contradicts your circumstances, not peace from your circumstances. There's nothing divine about that. Who's expecting peace from traffic? That makes no sense. And yet if traffic robs my peace, then I must have been expecting peace from the traffic. We're all insane. But the reality is he wants to produce peace that is contrary to the circumstances, that we could be walking in peace in circumstances that are not peaceful. We could be walking in hope in the midst of circumstances that cause anxiety. We want the cause of the anxiety to go away, and he wants to give us peace that speaks of his incredible grace to his glory in circumstances that would terrify other people. We love the sound of that, but who wants to be in circumstances that are terrifying? We all want the miraculous life of Christ, but no one wants to be in a circumstance that needs a miracle. We all want to walk on water while we're sitting in the boat. <laughs> Can't we just kind of surf? <laughs> we want the middle ground. Parasailing, God, I'm up for parasailing, but walking on water <laughs> sounds a little dangerous. 
I don't know where you are in your relationship with God today. I mean, I do and I don't. It's better than you think. If you're thinking you need to get closer to God or for an instant you think I am telling you that you need to get closer to God or do more for God or cause something in your relationship with God for him to bless you with what I'm talking about, then either you're not listening or I'm doing a really bad job. It is already true of who you are in Jesus Christ. If you have accepted him, you are a new creation. You are indwelt with his life. You are, as that video showed, seated in Christ with the Father. I'm not telling you to get there so that you have fullness in Christ. I'm telling you, you've got fullness in Christ. Stop striving for what you already have. It's like we're dragging water through the desert, wishing we had something to drink. Drink! We'll have to go back a verse, but when he came, or you already have it up there. Thank you. Good job. When he came to Simon Peter, when he was washing the disciples' feet, he did this crazy thing. He starting to wash the disciples' feet, and Peter says, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? I love the sarcasm and irony in scripture. I absolutely love it. He's like, uh, no. Are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus says, answered him. I love that he answered to him. What I'm doing, you do not, you cannot understand now. But afterward, meaning at Pentecost, which he's not about to explain in this moment, I'm just trying to wash your feet. Let's not try to get into the whole Pentecost thing. You're not going to know it till you know it, and then you're going to know that you know it, all right? But afterwards, you're going to know it. You can't know it now. So you just have to trust me. Dang it, don't you hate that? You just got to trust him. What are you doing in this circumstance? We'll see. Can I walk in the water? Maybe. Why don't you come on out? We don't like it. Feels risky. But I'm here to tell you, you're not producing the life on your own. You might as well go for it. You might as well go for it. Because you're not going to get over the hump of all of your needs in the flesh. You never can get there from here. You have to get there from the new creation self that's already who you are in Christ. You will never climb the ladder in the flesh, and you're already over the pole vault in Christ. Climb and climb and trying to get over it, and he's put us on his back and jumped over and said, there's no more law for you. You're now walking according to the fullness of Christ. He will never lead you in contrary to your nature, which is now righteous and holiness. So you just be available to God and let the law take care of the law. You just walk with me. You be fulfilled in me. You be available to me, and you'll experience the love and peace and joy and goodness and kindness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Wouldn't that be nice? Anybody trying to be more disciplined? Stop it. You are who he's made you to be. Live from him. Trust him. Trust him. You're better than you think. You're better off than you think. You've got more than you think. You, as your identity, are more than you think. And he's more in control than you think. He loves you more than you think. He has more power than you think. He's got a better plan than you can think. The best thing, the only thing, the wisest thing, the simplest thing that you can possibly do when you can do nothing to cause and create your own life, and he has already done everything necessary for life and godliness, is to trust him. And yet we don't. We're unbelieving believers. We believe every single word that's in here and we don't put our trust in much of it. Glad that you saved me. Now let me go live the Christian life. He's the one doing the living as we do the letting. I put my faith in him and he lives through me. We just don't think it'll work because we don't know two people living that way. I know, so I'm here. (laughs) I'm not saying that I do it well. Imagine me as like a six-year-old. I figured out how to walk and I'm helping my little brother. I am not the master of all things Christian. I just trip a little less than some other people because I've already tripped over everything in my life 10 times. So (laughs) Jesus says, hey, uh, Peter goes on and says, you're never gonna do this. This is not gonna happen. Uh, We have the next verse in there. Yeah, it says, Peter said, you shall never wash my feet. We don't talk that way. You shall never wash my feet. (laughs) Father, we don't, you know. Junior, where shall we go to lunch today? What sayest thou? We don't talk that way. So what he's really saying, 
I mean, this is Aramaic that they're speaking, translated in Greek, translated into Latin, and then translated into English. What he's really saying is, yeah, that's not going to happen. <laughs> no way. And then, like, 30 seconds later, he's like, well, yeah, okay. <laughs> Jesus answered him again. I love that. God is not being silent. We're just not listening. He answered him again. If I don't wash you, you have no share with me. You are not going to participate in Christ apart from what you receive from him. You want to walk in righteousness? It better be righteousness you receive, not what you accomplish. You want to walk in hope? It better be hope that you receive from him, not something that you're accomplishing from your circumstances. You want to love your spouse? I'm all for that. But listen, if you can accomplish that successfully on your own, then you're not going to participate in anything divine in your relationship with your spouse. If you don't receive it from him, you have no share with him. The only divine life you've got any hope of is the one that he freely gives you by grace and you receive and walk in by faith. Your faith, listen to me, your faith is not what you do for God. Your faith is what you trust God has and will do through you. Your faith is not what you, I'm doing all of this for God, hoping he'll pay me back. Look, if you could do what was necessary for God, then Christ died for nothing. If you could pay him back, you could have just done it in the first place. Stop wasting your life trying to pay for what he wants to freely give you so it'll speak of him instead of how good you are. What you do for God, what you do for God, who does that speak of? You. Look at how great I'm doing for God. But what he does by grace for you speaks of you. Don't get in front of that monitor. <laughs> Everybody's awake now. So he says, if I don't wash you, if you don't receive what only I can do on your behalf, then you have no participation with me at all. Nothing that I do, nothing that I'm about can you participate in unless you receive it from me first. Look, you can't walk as a child of God, or I'm sorry, you can't live as a father without living as a child of God. You can't be a good spouse without being a bride to Christ. You can't lead sheep or lead people or lead your kids unless you're a follower of him. You cannot give what you do not receive. That is living in the flesh. We're not in a transactional paradigm with God. We're in a relational paradigm with him. So what you need, he wants to give. You don't get to buy it with your own behavior. That's never going to work. It never did work. The old covenant didn't work. You've been made new. You're brought into relation, but he just wants to love you and love other people through you. And that's all over scripture. And we think it's up to us to be good enough to get what we're lacking. You're not lacking anything. Stop living the lie. The lie of lack will never get you to the place of divine life. But the fullness of Christ in by grace, if I'm willing to receive it and I'm willing to walk in it, then I get to participate in what only God can do in and through me. People say, Mike, you jump around so much, I can hardly watch you. I say, yeah, it's because the doctors told me I probably would never walk. So deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> so Peter turns around and goes, well, then wash all of me, my head and everything. He's like, no, 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 you're already clean. Who you are is okay already because you've already put your hope in me. You've already been clean. And to continue the analogy, if you've had a bath, you're clean, but you've been walking out in the wild, you need your feet washed. So every moment you have to receive from me, just like when you were saved, you had to receive that from me. This is not saying you've got to get clean every day because you're in your sin. No, he's saying every day you're living by grace through faith, just like when you were saved, you had to be saved by grace through faith. The economy doesn't change it. Now that I'm saved, I got to work for God. No, now that you've been saved, you get to live from God. That's the life that he gave you when you were saved. You get to live like you were saved. Colossians 2, 6 says, walk as you first believed by grace through faith. I need to close up here, but here's the deal. So he washed Peter's feet, he sat back down, and he left them with this hanging question. Have you seen what I've done? I'm the only one that could do it. And he sat down, Jesus sat down, and one person at the table still had dirty feet. 
Jesus. You ever think about that? Jesus washed everybody else's feet. He said, you got to receive it from me to participate in it with me. And Judas's feet was clean. Were clean. Was clean. Judas's feet were clean. Each foot was clean. I don't know. They were clean. <laughs> All the toes of Judas were clean. And Jesus had dirty feet. My friends, that is the gospel. He who knew no sin, he who was perfectly clean, he who was righteously white robed, holier than anyone ever who has lived on the earth, he who was completely ignorant of sin in his own experience became sin so that you and I could be made the very righteousness of God. Judas was made clean at Christ's expense of getting dirty. That should blow your mind. I've been teaching this for years, and it blows my mind every time. The question for you today is, first of all, have you put your hope in Christ? Because I don't know how you're doing it if you haven't. And if it's hard, and it's, uh, life is a challenge, and you've not ever, you know some things of scripture, you've been in a few churches, but you've never said, my hope is not in what I do in this life. It's what he did through his death and crucifixion on my behalf. If you've made that decision, you've been born again. And if you've never made that decision, you just believe some stuff in scripture. You've got to choose where you're going to place your hope. Everybody saw the storm. Everybody saw Jesus. And one guy jumped. That's the difference. Oh, look oh he's walking on water i believe people can walk on water but one person walked on water that's putting your hope in jesus so if you've never done that that's what you got to do that's the one thing you get the life you get the hope you get the abundance you get the spirit you get all of that stuff now i know you know a lot of christians that it doesn't look any different but that's not because they don't have life that means they're still trying to cause their own life that's called the flesh not the spirit it doesn't mean they're lacking god's life and if you've already put your hope in Jesus Christ, there's no hocus pocus to this. Are you living with a hope in him? Or are you living in a hope in you? Have you put your hope in what he did in the cross? Or are you just trying to be good enough on your own? Because if you put your hope in him once, then you were reborn and there's no being unborn. You don't have to go, maybe I did, maybe I didn't. Well, is your hope in him for your eternal salvation or is it in you? Because if it's in him, you don't have, there's no heebie-jeebies that you have to get. You're okay. Your hope is not in you. You're okay. You had to get in the boat. You're in the boat. You're good. You've been reborn as a new creation in Christ, a child of God. Now, if that's the case, my suggestion is to stop trying to cause your life to be what he's already made it. You were crucified with Christ. You've been resurrected with Christ. You've ascended with Christ. And if you remember the two chairs, you are now seated at the right hand of the throne of God in Christ. Stop trying to climb into God's chair and control everything in your life. It's never going to work. Instead, sit in the security and rest and relationship and fullness that already is Christ in you. Because he didn't die so that you would be better. He died so that he could be enough. And you can enjoy the life that only he can live in and through you. To the glory of the Father by his grace. Let's start living that grace life more deliberately. So that our life will speak of all he's done for us. Not all I'm struggling to do for him. You're freer than you know. You're more empowered and loved than you know. The work for you is more finished than you know. And the life for you to walk in with him for eternity has just begun. Let me pray for you guys. Father, I love that your truth excites, that your power uh, is real, that the life is truly ours. Jesus, you told us that you are the way that we walk. You're not just pointing to the way. You're the way. We get to walk relationally with you. And you told us, Jesus, that you are the truth. I love that. We don't have to come to know something that you want to show us. We come to know you. It's relational. We know you and you are life to us. You're the truth that we know. And as we walk with you and as we come to know you, Jesus, you are the life that we experience. You don't give us a life besides yourself. We actually get to experience you in us, participating your divinity in our humanity, just like God's divinity was in your humanity when you walked on the earth. Father, Jesus, Spirit, we come to you wholeheartedly recognizing just 
wanting to embrace the reality of your enoughness by grace for our real spiritual life. It's who we are. So show us what we have. Open our eyes to who we really are, our identity in Christ by grace, and who is really in control so that we don't have to be. And we can walk in the freedom and rest that you've given us already by grace. We praise you and we thank you, Jesus. Amen. Love you guys. Thank you for having me.
shake before you The demons run and flee At the mention of your name King of majesty close out the service here in just a second with a special time. I want to introduce myself. For those of you, I try to meet everybody coming in. My name is Ryan Abernathy. I have the privilege of serving as a teaching pastor here at West Metro. And Mike, brother, I want to say thank you so much, man, for coming and pouring into us. I, uh, Rob Feltz introduced me to Mike during the, uh, the pandemic. And the, I will say, brother, the videos you've done have blessed me, but your presence here has blessed all of us so much in so many ways. And we're so grateful to you. And those of you who have come here, particularly who know Mike, uh, we're really thankful that you would come and join us this morning. And I would just say, if you don't have a church, we're like this every Sunday. So it's always, th- we, we, we really want to be a church where we try to live out Jesus, mercy, family, and authenticity. You can come here and be real. And so... We're so thankful for Mike coming and reinforcing the message of grace that we teach and that we want to model in our lives. And so, brother, thank you so much for coming and investing in us. So uh, as uh, part of the leadership here at West Metro, we love doing two things. We love baptizing people who trusted Jesus as their Savior. That's our first thing we love doing. But the other thing we love doing publicly is is getting a chance to dedicate children to the Lord. And so I want to ask Melody if she would bring her mama and daddy up here. Now, I've been doing this for a while, so you'll notice I do not attempt to hold the baby because we like for, we like for our little ones to stay happy and, and, well, I look weird and children respond oddly to me, so. Uh, but this is, I, I know she does and I'm thankful for that, but this is Lizzie and Jacob Major and this is Melody Rose. And isn't she pretty? Isn't she gorgeous? I mean, and she's got a bow, which makes, uh, I've got four daughters, we, they were all bow heads, and so it just makes everybody happy, so, but, uh, so here's the deal, she was born June 17, 2020, so you're a pandemic baby, we're going to call you that for the rest of your life, isn't that so special? So, but here, we have, we have been blessed to have Lizzie and Jacob in our church uh, since they were teenagers, and I got a chance, I got a chance to be a small part of their wedding, Big Chris Prime uh, did their wedding. And, uh, and this beautiful little girl has been prayed for and, uh, and wanted so bad. And we are so incredibly thankful that she is here. So at, at West Metro, we do not believe that uh, baby dedications or anything that save a child. You have to come to a place and point where you trust Jesus as your Savior, the way Mike was talking about this morning. But, so this is, but this is a public dedication on the part of her parents that they are going to raise her in the fear and admonition of the Lord. And so I want to say a few things to them and to some extended family and to the church this morning. So, Jacob, brother, you know, and, and we've talked about this forever, this starts with you, man. As, as the leader inside of your household, this starts with you to model Jesus for your baby, to show her what it means to receive grace from her father. 
And so, yeah, see, she's already a daddy's girl. She's already learning that really well. And so, brother, it starts with you. And then, Lizzie, you know that, that the vital role that you play as Jacob's partner in raising her, you're her mama. She gets life from you. You're her favorite person when, she, when you walk into the room because you, you, you're carrying that life with you. And so as you guys, as parents, your first and foremost job in her, this is the first church she'll ever go to is your house, learning about Jesus from you and teaching her to follow Jesus and what that means and what that looks like. And so that for the today, part of that is just saying that publicly. That's what, what you are going to do. But you know what? You can't do that without help. Now, there is a small army over here. <laughs> Of, of Majors and McClure. So would you guys go ahead and stand, please? If you're a part of Jacob and Lizzie's family, I want you to stand up. And I don't, I don't know all of you, but I do know that many of you, many of you, I'm privileged to know you, that I know that you love Jesus. And so here's the thing. They're not always going to have all the answers. Grandma and grandpa, aunts, uncles, cousins, family, friend, the, you that, that know Jesus, you're going to have to come alongside them at some point in time and help them and give them answers to questions. And you are responsible as well. For helping this beautiful little girl to know what it means to follow and trust Jesus. And that's a huge responsibility. That's an awesome responsibility. So my, my prayer for you is that you guys would embrace that as their partners in helping their daughter to know what it means to follow Jesus. But you would also realize and recognize you'll have your own role in that as well. And that you would embrace that. And then church family, here's the thing. There are, there are many of you that are in here that you're a part of West Metro or maybe you're going to be a part of West Metro one of these days. And you're going to have a chance to interact with this beautiful little baby as well, and mama and daddy and their extended family. And so West Metro family, I want to ask about you guys to stand up. As everybody tries to keep her happy. <laughs> as a church body, we have a responsibility to partner with them, to welcome this child. You're a nursery worker. Guess what? You're a part of this team. You're, a, you're somebody who attends this church. Guess what? You're a part of this team. Because it takes all of us working together to help each of us follow Jesus. And so knowing that and embracing that and understanding that, I just want to ask you just where you are to join me in prayer as we dedicate this child to the Lord. <laughs> Father God, I thank you for the privilege of getting to pastor this family and the, the privilege of being able to be a part of serving this church. And I thank you for this beautiful little girl that you have given and trusted to them. Father, I thank you for Jacob and Lizzie, for their deep faith and their passion for you. It comes out of so many aspects of their lives. And I thank you, Father, that Melody will get a chance to grow up knowing what it means that Jesus loves her. Because she'll see it from her mama and her daddy. I thank you for the legacy of faith that they have. And I pray, Father, that you would help Melody as she grows to know what it means to follow you, to hear your voice, and to trust you as her Savior. God, I pray for their family, the people who are grandma, grandpa, cousin, aunt, uncle, all the people who love them and who love her. And I pray, Father, that as they see her follow Jesus, they would want to be called to follow Jesus as well, and that those who know him would seek to help her to grow and deepen her. Father, I pray for us as a church body that you would help each of us, Father, to be a part of pointing her to you. God, that we would help to strengthen what Jacob and Lizzie will build and begin in her life and help her as she grows in her faith. Father, we commit this baby to you, Melody Rose. We thank you for the blessing that she is. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining with us today. We love you guys so much. We hope if you're a guest, we'll see you back next Sunday. Y'all have a great afternoon. Enjoy it.
Good job, guys. Sounded great. Sounded great. Glad to uh, 